The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. So what if Bioshock were an early 90s movie set in the Jersey Turnpike area with a lot of big name comedy stars? That's right, we're going to talk about nothing but trouble. What the fuck? Um. Hey everybody, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivancy. And we're here to talk about one of the weirdest <laughs> films ever made, I think. Just from conception to realization, every step of the way, you have to kind of wonder, what were these people thinking? And I think we can kind of answer that, uh, at least somewhat. Uh, that does, it's, it's nothing but trouble. Uh, Audrey, if you'd like to provide a brief plot synopsis. Sure. <laughs> Good luck. Chevy Chase is kind of, he's a published investment... He, he, Writer. Yeah, he has a financial magazine. Yeah, and he's throwing a party. He's very um, well-to-do, has lots of cash to throw around, and he meets Demi Moore in the elevator as he's going up to the party. He has an opportunity to go and hang out with her and drive to go see her ex-boyfriend where she's going to go slap him in the face well, and yeah. break up with him or something. Or something. And then these two Brazilianaires follow them. They go on a long road trip and detour into the wrong neighborhood, so to speak. We're about 11 minutes into the movie at this point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> basically they they enter this shire not a hobbit shire not a hobbit shire which is basically a junkyard enchanted forest what they get in trouble for speeding they get in trouble for not stopping at a stop sign. that's right and they're taken by john candy police officer john candy that's right why don't you do this because <laughs> <laughs> i wanted to take a drink of water <laughs> They go before the Reeve, which is the local justice of the peace, played by Dan Aykroyd in a lot of makeup, a lot of prosthetics. And, and, and he has a personal grudge against anybody involved in the banking industry, and so things get worse. The digital underground is involved. Tupac Shakur is in this goddamn movie and, and, and performs a song with Humpty Hump. Like, what the fuck? I, I feel <laughs> as if everything that I enjoyed about the 80s is rolled up into a ball of taxidermy and put on the wall. Right, and in a like but and a lot of feces in it. <laughs> feces and hair. And dick jokes. Right, and and just shoved right into your face for an hour and forty minutes. So they, they try to escape and, and wacky hijinks ensue. Also a random Baldwin is murdered. We, it, it oh my god this movie let's talk about our what the fuck moments audrey you you start there. uh yeah sure draw bridges in the junkyard a modular condiment train circumcised penis for a nose a cat doorbell <laughs> i think kind of a, a a an honorary what the fuck moment uh, like no, it, it, what would be the opposite of du jour? Not of the day, but of every second. Uh, uh, what the fuck moment per diem is every goddamn line Dan Aykroyd says. I don't know what the hell he said at any point in this entire movie when he's playing the Reeve. He plays two or three characters. Yeah. And uh, as the Reeve, I was like, I don't, I just, I don't have a fucking clue. It was just like, rah, 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 condiment, rah, 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 well, I banker. actually wrote some down. <laughs> if you want to know, Michael. Uh, pun collar. Rah, 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 Good rah, luck, cornflake. <laughs> Basically, this movie was like, if we put somebody in a lot of makeup or in drag and or a lot of makeup, that's funny, right? That'll be funny. Like, John Candy plays a mute woman and he plays her in drag. Auto mechanic. The problem there is that so much of this movie, they don't seem to get that just because you have a comedic actor, that doesn't make it funny. John Candy is, and Chevy Chase both, they aren't just good comedic actors, they're good actors. And so they play the parts as they should be played rather than for comedy. Chubby, more like characters. Yeah, yeah and, and so it's like uh, John Candy and Drag is really more heartbreaking than anything <laughs> else. I mean, that character I felt really bad for. Aldana. Yeah, I, he just... It, 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 he, I, you would be amazed at how much character he could bring to a mute fake woman. I thought it was awesome. I thought, I thought that was excellent, actually. This entire movie, I feel as if you might have liked it a bit more than me. Well, yeah, it's probably the 20th time I've seen it. And I think the first time I saw it was when I was like eight or nine years old. I didn't like it then. Yeah. I, I like it way more now. I saw it in the theater and um, 
that's the only time that I've seen it beyond besides now. And I remember at the time just feeling so betrayed, <laughs> like deep down in my soul. The, a, a movie that we both uh, compared it to in our notes I thought was funny uh, and, and was a movie that when I was younger I didn't like and as an adult I've grown to love, love, love it is The Burbs. And, totally. And I think The Burbs and especially Ghostbusters because Dan Aykroyd is involved so heavily are both examples of how you can do comedy horror right because this is very straight up a comedy horror movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's basically a dungeon whipping, whipping yard Right. It's, it's got a survival horror feel to it. It, it reminded me a lot of Red State, uh, which I just watched recently. Kevin Smith movie blew me away. So fucking good. It's survival horror. Not what you would expect from Kevin Smith, but he does it really well. I, I really was reminded a lot of that in this movie. There's there's a scene in which uh, Chevy Chase is, like, thrown into a pile of bones. There's actually multiple yeah. scenes where he's thrown into piles of bones. And that made me think of the burbs a lot, specifically those moments. But, you know, it's something... So here's something that I have always thought about for many, many years. Because growing up, I wanted to be a stand-up comedian, and I loved horror movies. And so I thought a lot about the fact that horror and comedy are basically the same thing. Both of them manipulate juxtaposition and timing. It's all about the timing of when something happens. I mean, that's why a cat scare works, right? And that was the, the one joke that I genuinely laughed at in this movie was the cat doorbell because it made sense that at a horror house, the doorbell would be a cat scare. Like that, I was like, whoever thought that up deserves an Oscar. Everybody else deserves like a little hair of the dog that bit them and like a swift talking to that's like, no, honey, no. What the hell are you doing with your life? I, I do totally agree that the the horror and the comedy are, you know, they're just so closely related. I think Doug Bradley from Hellraiser, Pinhead, had said that at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival I went mm. to in a panel. It was, it was... Also, also a Cradle of Filth fame. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. actually, I think I heard that. Yeah, probably yeah. from me. Yeah, he, he does the vocals on, or not the vocals, but voices on a lot of Cradle of Filth songs. So the idea that you could mix the two, I think, is, is really... Uh, smart and good the, the the like the the point that i was trying to make about why a cat scare works is because you build up tension build up tension build up tension and then the timing of the scare is what makes it work it, and that's why i hate when people cheat with cat scares and they cut because that's using filmic cheat rather than a cheat based on perception and timing this is why something like the burbs it fits really well it doesn't like, it kind of makes you uncomfortable at the end once you find out everything is real. But it also, the, the timing, the beats work. And beyond that, uh, a big example of, it, of horror working, I think, is from Dust Till Dawn. A lot of people feel jolted by the change halfway through when it goes from exploitation comedy to horror movie. But I'm mm -hmm. like, no, no, no. Dust Till Dawn is a horror novel rather than a horror movie. Because horror novels... It's, actually, it's a strip club here in Portland now. Is it? They haven't opened yet, but they have a sign. Nice. Down, um, I think, McLaughlin. Is it called Titty Twister or is it called From Dust Till Dawn? It's called From Dust Till Dawn. Okay, yeah. yeah. Then it's it, <laughs> then they, they pushed out a little, but that's okay. And Jiggles is gone. We're just we're know, losing them the all here. Ending. But but that's the thing. It's it, it, it's a horror novel because if you read most horror novels, the first half of them are building character. And the second half is when everything goes to hell. Most horror movies, you have to put in some sort of you know, somebody gets their eye plucked out or whatever the hell it has to be every, like, 15 minutes or so, or else the producers fear that you're going to lose your audience, mm -hmm. which is, of course, ridiculous. I mean, the entire point uh, of horror, I think, is to make you care about the characters first, mm -hmm. then you're rooting for them more, yeah. and if something you bad happens... You give them happens, a world, then you take it away. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I always find this movie entertaining. Yeah, the quotes are great. Dan Aykroyd as Judge Reeves. Um, yeah, some of those were... She's got your taint on her now. Called someone a pud collar, basically. If you put one on, you can satisfy Aldana. What else was there? Jimmy Hoffa is still missing. Here's his ID. <laughs> right, because they, they, they find an attic, uh, and it has newspaper clippings of all these people who have gone missing, and then the IDs, because uh, the, the court system there takes your ID away. The best one I thought the, <laughs> that I really liked in that scene was he says, oh, look, a busload of Hare Krishnas went missing. And the camera pans over or cuts or whatever. And you see that whoever printed up that fake newspaper fucked up and it actually says 
bus loads of Hare Krishnas missing. <laughs> so apparently, like, half of that goddamn bone pile is Hare Krishnas. Yeah. When talking about the bigger picture of horror and comedy and how well they blend and how well they can overlap, the reason that I feel this failed on so many levels for me is that for that to work, you have to have a strong and or interesting character. Tom Hanks in The Burbs is not what I would call strong, but he's fascinating to watch because he's just so ridiculous and over the top and, you know, take me to the hospital, I'm sick, you know. All that sort of stuff, and it's 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 fun to watch him kind of losing his mind, and then to feel vindicated at the end. You feel like yeah, but also a little scared for him, and and that's why I think it works so well. In here, we have essentially four main protagonists, if you will. We have this Brazilian brother sister team mm -hmm. who Brazilianaires, ta yeah, tag along Brazilianaires, <laughs> and they they are portrayed as nothing but annoying. Uh, in fact, one of them, whose name is Fausto continues to tempt Chris, Chris Fur, Chris, Chris Fausto <laughs> tempts, yeah, 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 he's, it, so it's Faust tempting Christ, essentially, mm -hmm. in, in really, like, horribly overdone symbolism, and, and, just, just, oh my god, but, but so they're annoying, and, and I didn't really want them to survive, but and, they did. yeah, and then our main characters are Chevy Chase, who is, this rich banker who's really only trying to get in Demi Moore's pants. Like, that's yeah. all we know about him. Mm -hmm. And then Demi Moore, who is going to yell at a guy who dumped her and made her sad, Who's I a, think. a lawyer that doesn't actually seem to know how to practice law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she doesn't, she does not do a very good job. She didn't help him at all when and, they got in trouble. And she's like a terrible uh, designated reporter of events. She just... It's, it's her, though I will say, I, kudos to Demi Moore. I think she pulled off, considering she was kind of the um, Sigourney Weaver from Ghostbusters character, you know, she's the straight man for everything. I thought she somehow was able to make her character seem three-dimensional most of the time, which she deserves a fucking Oscar. There's one scene where I was like, is Demi Moore high? Where she just starts making out with Chevy Chase for no apparent reason? And she's still talking at the same time. So that scene was... And she said, uh, you're nothing but trouble. Yeah. I think that's got... the only time we got it. There's there's somewhere else where someone says, like, this is all trouble or something like that. But, it, but yeah, I think that's the only time we got the nothing but trouble line. It's also, as a title, it doesn't really make much sense in general. Because it's like, it should be called, like, Haunted Redneck Place or something. Yeah, uh... No, not Haunted, but Scary Redneck Place. Or... Sinkhole. Yeah, sinkhole, or, I don't know, some sort of play on coal, uh, uh... No more or, overseas investments on coal. Or, like, mine dearest or something like that, you know? But, no, but anyway. So, as I say, that that's why this failed both comedy and horror for me, is that, honestly, if all of our main characters had just been thrown into the bone stripper and murdered, mm -hmm. I would have been okay with that. I, I think the movie's just starting to be weird. You think so? Just yeah, that's... They're just like, you know, with Bobo and the little devil and stuff, there's those characters that are just kind of weird, and you don't know really why they're there. They're not necessarily funny, they're more obnoxious. And with that dynamic... It's just shifting, you know, up and down like the roller coaster, you know. I, I guess, which, if we want to talk about Bobo and the Little Devil, though, that really brings me... This movie hates fat people. Just a ton of fat shaming in this movie. Well, they're, well they're wearing diapers, they're sweaty and dirty, and they, they're acting they, like children. They're like the Humpty Dumpties. Right, they jiggle all over the place when they move. Also, Eldana is played completely for laughs about because of her size. You know, it's like she's putting out like underwear for her wedding mm -hmm. night. And it's like, it's funny because they're all huge and that's not sexy and blah, blah, blah. And it just, there's just so much. And, and the, oh, and Dan Aykroyd's character is, you know, gigantic, just covered in uh, prosthetics and makeup and everything. And so he's this huge character. And it's like, of course, when he goes to bed, it's all, rah, rah, and then the ubiquitous fart noise and it just it's like uh, this movie just hates fat people i don't know if dan Aykroyd like has some sort of phobia because dan Aykroyd wrote the screenplay the story was by peter Aykroyd. i'm assuming a uh, relation of his i guess it's just trying to be weird but it felt really upsetting that like weird to them is brazilians and fat people like it was just like you know and everybody being tortured and trapped on this 
this little shire. Yeah, it, it, well, I mean, and it just, it just, it felt like weird to them was like just them shaming people. I mean, I, literally at one point, Chevy Chase makes fun of people speaking Portuguese, I assume. Which part was that? When they're driving along and he's like, maka, maka, da, 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 just shut up. And it's like, wow, really? They went there? Like it just, it's, it's, it was an uncomfortable watch at times. Now I know you wanted to talk about kind of more of the politics of this movie, which, which ties into that because Chevy Chase is a financial advisor of some sort. And mm -hmm. that's part of the reason why I was kind of like, yeah, I'm with the Reeve here. Like, I don't give a shit if he yeah. lives or dies, but you wanted to say more. So on yeah, that, so basically Justice Reeves hates bankers because earlier on in his career, he got some bad investment advice about digging coal under his property. It's now burning and been burning for 80 years. It's kind of put his establishment at risk. He's made it his life goal to basically kill everybody who comes through if they have any banking relations. And what I saw that as is basically that he's mad because these poor investments ruined his life and they basically demonized the coals. I think that that's pretty much showing that that overseas investments are going to be a bad idea. Coal miners nightmare. How about that yeah, as a title? Yeah, How about cool. that as a title? <laughs> Yeah, it was strange. The movie just kind of randomly in the middle or out of nowhere is uh, suddenly like anti-financial institution. Anti like it felt like the whole Bernie Madoff thing could have been shoved in here. I think this movie's from 91. I, I could be off by a couple of years, but I think it's about there. So the big stock market crash had just happened. So at its heart, this movie is kind of sort of like Oliver Stone's Wall Street. Well, the thing is, our typical heroes, the ones that are going and being tortured and stuff, are actually the villains. Yeah. And the, and the justice is actually trying to keep the peace. And that's why he's so appreciated by his own community. It's like Cannibal Holocaust. Who's the real cannibal? Yeah. Who's the real person living off of human misery? Mm-hmm. And causing all the problems. Of course, the problem is, is that in the at the end, our protagonists get away and are happy in the end. And the Brazilianaires get away and they're fine. Like, the only really happy, happy ending that we get is uh, John Candy's character, who is like, this is all just stupid. I'm going to go away to Brazil and yeah, he, start uh, banging this hot Brazilian. Let the Bra Brazilians live and get away from the, the camp, and um, they promise the money. Yeah. And fell in love. Normally, I enjoy a movie that is amoral, because that's really where this film falls because there's no heroes, there's no villains, there's just people. And normally I enjoy that, but I feel like for the sort of movie they were going for, one with kind of a message and a comedy horror, they did a really bad job of being so amoral that I just did not care about anything. Yeah. There was just so much going on. Also, I kind of sort of disliked Chevy Chase from the first shot because for whatever reason at this period in his life, Chevy Chase looked <laughs> identical to George W. Bush. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was the same at chin to hair ratio, for sure. Also, I, uh, another thing, another point against them is that neither Chevy Chase nor Demi Moore really seem to care much when the Brazilian couple is getting fucking shot at and they're, oh, you know, and it's like, out the window. Yeah, it's, it's like, release the dogs and people are shooting out the window at the, them where they've just jumped and they're just like, well, let's get comfortable for the night. Yeah. Oh, and Chevy Chase keeps trying to throw out these little one-liners and it made me feel like, you know how there's a difference between somebody who's funny in real life and portraying while on screen. Mm -hmm. That to me, and, and like some people are able to bridge that gap, like say Bill Murray. I mean, Bill Murray you watch and you just feel like this is what it's like to hang out with Bill Murray, basically. Chevy Chase did that and I was like, I bet these were all ad libs that Chevy Chase did on set and people laughed so they kept them in, but they shouldn't have been kept in because it just, it was like, all right, it, is his character a fucking stand-up? Because that's how it, you know, every scene for him was just a chance to be like, oh, hey, biggerly boggerly bo, you know? Yeah, it just, yeah. it, did, it did not work, and it wasn't funny, and it just was confusing. I just, you know, I think of that that kind of comedy for the time. I think that everyone just kind of watched it because of the stars. That I, I mean, that's certainly what drew me yeah. to it, because uh, I love Chevy K Chase, I love John Candy, mm -hmm. love Dan Aykroyd, and, you know, I, Ghostbusters for me is like the most seminal film of my life basically and then this was just like wow they can make a bad movie <laughs> 
I did not know that. I was not aware. What a huge budget that looked like. I yeah, mean, pretty wow. pretty big budget. I mean, it wasn't, you know, like, say, stealth or whatever budget-wise, but it was... Um, uh, they had a mini Wonderland. Did they? You keep saying, like, Enchanted Forest and Wonderland. I so, feel like yeah, it, it was littered with all these, um, you know, statues and knickknacks and things that don't necessarily belong in a junkyard for decor. It just kind of reminded me of walking through the Enchanted Forest if it was all made out of scrap metal. Okay, I can see that. I, I, uh -huh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I I think what they were going for is just that it was once this booming town, and now everything from the town is just all shoved into one place. But yeah, I okay, I did not get a Wonderland vibe. But And no. then with the roller coaster, and all the other the trap doors, and all the houses, and what? torturing devices, and moving walls, and... Which I loved how everything had labels on it, you know? It's like, here's the button for Bone Stripper. I... <laughs> I mean, it was it was very uh, Pee Wee's Big Adventure, mm -hmm. where everything was kind of this insane pulley driven death machine or breakfast maker. Oh yeah, the Austin Powers um, con control center where you just you know drop someone down. Was that, I I don't even remember that. I was thinking about that. The yeah, other it's like day. the buttons. Yeah. Do you have any other points that you want to um, make before we get to the wrap up? Oh yeah, Demi Moore wearing her onesie when the was whole that? the whole entire show. Oh, that's right. The yeah, the, it was the a white onesie. onesie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. was like this faux shorts and a top, but it was a onesie, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah, it was all connected romper. Right. And she had her little play adventure. I think that's what they call them play suits. Those really? Ones, yeah. So she went wow. on her adventure in her play suit for the whole thing. I thought that was pretty cute. Right. And when Chevy Chase and that random Irish dude see her for the first time, it is like she's stepped out of the fucking elevator in a Victoria's Secret, like, visible nipple outfit or something. <laughs> it's like, yeah, that romper. Rah, yeah. I'm going to show her my rump, romper's room. I, that really didn't work. <laughs> I cannot stress how weird this is. There is a hip-hop music video in the middle of it where the Reeve demands that they show, prove that they're musicians, and suddenly we just get like, to the hip, to the hop, to the hippity hop, hop. The digital underground. <laughs> right, and, and it's like, what the fuck are we watching? Like, it just... A music video. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I guess that was a different time. Do you remember, what was the last movie that you saw that had a song that was made for that movie? Because the last one I remember is Ghostbusters 2. What was the song? Uh, it was, wasn't it Bobby Brown? It was like Saving the Day or whatever? Yeah, um, I mean, there's that, uh, what is it, Pet Cemetery? These are old, the Ramones, right? I don't oh, want to be yeah, buried, I Pet forgot. Cemetery. I don't want to be And then buried. there was like MC Hammer from the Ninja Turtles movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm, what else? Let's see. Yeah. Titanic, what's her name? Celine Dion. Was that, would we count that though? Because it wasn't. So. I think that counts. I mean, it was a song made for the movie, but it wasn't. It, did it have anything to do with the movie? I don't remember. Yeah, I think her heart will go on even though Dude Buddy like died and froze to death. Dude in the Buddy? Wire. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the real tragedy of that movie was that uh, the, the movie. Billy, Z <laughs> Billy Zane was dead. I love the just, just... Demon Knight. Demon Knight. I love in that Demon movie, he was Knight. like, how about Demon if I play Knight. a vampire, guys? And they were like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like it. To wrap things up here, because this is I this is what I kept doing during the movie, which is flashing to other movies that I wish I were watching. Uh, you peeled the correct banana there. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> the So, to wrap things up... What one thing would you change about this movie to make it just an instant classic? Chevy Chase and Eldana get it on. Like graphic on screen? Or it's just some simulation on a bed. Like perhaps we get a pillow a and then night. her head is and laid then... down upon it? Yes, exactly. <laughs> While some digital, like some slow jams, digital underground and plays. And light comes into it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I seriously, I, I don't know. I think I think the movie needs to pick a genre because it just did not straddle the fence very well. I think the idea of, like, say, the Bonfire of the Vanities type characters get put into a saw-like death trap machine mm -hmm. could be entertaining because, again, they're... Like, that whole amorality, mm -hmm. you could play around with that and, and, you know, I mean, I think that could be fun and interesting and maybe through the movie you, you find out, oh, this person has a character or whatever. Like, for instance, I still don't know the backstory for Demi Moore exactly, except well, I, that I guess she broke up with someone. But it's like, was he a douche or... He was a... Well, I don't... Yeah, because Chevy Chase said, oh, I, I might stay away from that guy. 
Oh, maybe I'll give yeah, him but, another chance and I'll and I'll go driving with you. Right, but Chevy Chase is also kind of a douche. So. They're all yeah. They're I guess they're all equally yeah. douchey. I I mean it's just really up in the air what happened. We never we never get a story there. So I I think if they'd pushed it farther into horror rather than kind of trying to play it safe with the comedy, uh, I think it's just like a hodgepodge of potpourri movie. They just threw everything in and hit blend. That certainly could be, but it came out tasting like poop. It was praline and dick. Pud collar. <laughs> Patina of pud collar after you finish eating it. So, yeah. If you have any feedback, questions, comments, anything like that, info at iceonmars.net. But for now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And Audrey Ivan's Yeah, you all take care out there. Bye-bye. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. Well, that was weird.